Chapter 13 The pink monkeys came at first in small groups and behaved courteously. They were able to communicate in a garbled, ugly attempt at the master language. It was comprehensible, although their pronunciation was laughable. They said they were, in essence, simple traders. Employees of a trading company from far away, but news had reached even that remote location of the riches of the forest of Arignani, where it was possible to find produce that grew nowhere else in the world, berries whose unknown flavors brought tears of joy to the eyes of those who ate them. And gourds of a rich sweetness no other gourds could rival, and there were fruits with no names because they had never entered the outside world where things had to be named in order to exist and there were also nameless fish that swam in the jungle's rivers, so succulent that men, and monkeys, might cross the world to taste them. We ask your permission to receive some of the bounty of the forest, the pink monkeys said, and we will repay you in any currency that would be meaningful to you. Maybe it's time you learned the value of silver and gold. The pink monkeys suggested to the brown and green monkeys, and, through them, to the forest in general and even to Arignani herself. The sound they made to describe these coins was like a word from the language of the East Coast, kaku, which, because they couldn't pronounce things properly, they called cash. Kaku, cash, is the future, they said. With kaku you can have a place in that future. Without it, unfortunately, you will become irrelevant and in the end the future will arrive like a forest fire and burn your jungle to the ground. The green and brown monkeys were both seduced by the pink monkeys' courtesies and scared into cooperation by their threats. The other jungle creatures ignored the embassies of these bizarre aliens with the terrible accents. Only the wild women of the forest and, it is said, the goddess Aranyani herself understood the danger to their way of life. The future was a menace they had no desire to confront. But for a long time they didn't know how to act. We may perhaps best understand the pink monkey narrative as an aspect of the Jayapurjaya's fascination with time, time divided into yesterdays, todays, and tomorrows. The monkeys we first encountered in these verses, the grey Hanuman Lungors of Basnaga, are, we may say, the poet's gesture toward the mythical past of the great legends, while these pink newcomers represent an as yet unknown tomorrow, a tomorrow that will fully arrive long after the poet's work is done. This, at least, is the proposition which, with all due modesty, is here advanced. When Pampa Campana told for now pace she had to leave, and would appreciate the gift of a horse, the foreigner made no argument. At the very beginning you told me that you were just passing through my life, he said, so I can't complain that you misled me in any way. And if as you say you are a miraculous ancient being who was once the lover of Domingo Nunes, then I must also accept, even if I can't believe it, that you see me as little more than an echo of, or a substitute for, your earlier beloved. At any rate I'm grateful for the gift of your time. And a horse is the least I can offer in return. She had one last meeting with Madhuri Devi in the old house with the alcove. I will never see you again, she told the former astrologer but I know I am leaving my city and the empire in safe hands. Make sure you find safe hands to hand them to when it's your time. I have never thought of you as a supernatural being, although you are, Madhuri Devi replied. But now I see your solitude and the sadness that it brings. We are just fleeting shadows on a screen for you. How lonely that must be. I whispered in the king's ear last night, Pampa Campana said. So don't be surprised if he announces his decision to ban the burning of widows in the whole of the empire, and to restore the status of women in Basnaga to the way it used to be. The new remonstrance would not have allowed the burning anyway, Madhuri Devi said. But thank you, it's easier if the king already agrees. No more burning widows, Pampa Campana said, instead of saying goodbye. No more burning widows, Madhuri Devi replied. Then they parted knowing it would be forever. After Pampa Campana left Basnaga for the second time, the so-called Second Golden Age came to an abrupt end, as if by her departure she had brought down the curtain on those years. Deva Raya died, and happily no women were burned on his pyre. The twelve thousand wives were released into the world to make their way in it as best they could. 
incompetence and corruption followed. We may pass over the sequence of incompetent kings, each murdered by the next ruler. There were decapitations and straw-stuffed heads. And finally the last, pathetic Sangama king was decapitated by a general named Saluva, and the founding dynasty of Bisnaga came to an end. Pampa Campana has little to tell us about the short-lived Saluva dynasty, even though in this period the fortunes of the empire were much restored. But she writes with affection about a certain Taluva Narasa Naika, another general, whose Taluva dynasty soon supplanted the Saluvas, and who regained the rest of the lost territories, kept Safarabad and the other adversaries at a distance. And was the father of the man during whose reign Pampa Campana would learn the most profound lesson in love of her long life. In her epic poem, she taunts us, her readers, with this hint of a love story to come, but then refuses to elaborate further writing only, with her characteristic simplicity of expression. Before all that, we had to fight the monkeys. As she wrote out of Bisnaga Pampa Campana, saddened by her last conversation with Fernau Pays, in which he had understood that he was no more than an echo of the past, was thinking about Domingo Nunes, and the three daughters whose father he had been, a father pushed into the shadows, his paternity never recognized. I wronged him, she told herself, and maybe that is why I have no grandchildren of his line. It is the revenge of his blood. Her daughters, who had inherited some, at least, of the magic with which the goddess had filled their mother, would be the end of a line, not the beginning of a dynasty. Magic would fade from the world and banality would replace it. As she rode back toward Aranyani's forest, which was to say into the very heart of the fabulous, she was already mourning the victory of the humdrum, the mundane, over that other reality. The victory of the line of ordinary boys over that of extraordinary girls. And perhaps of pink monkeys over the forest of women. Yuktasri Sangama was waiting for her at the edge of the forest, looking like her mother's ghost. She was indifferent to the disparity in their appearances. I know what it means to be your daughter, she said to Pampa Campana. It means to become your grandmother before I die. She had no interest in discussing that any further. I waited too long to call you, she said. Things are bad here, and the final conflict will begin very soon. The beginning of the problem was the willingness of the forest's green and brown monkeys to invite groups of pink monkeys into their trees. Soon, some of the pink leaders had persuaded the green monkeys that they needed to be afraid of the brown tribe, while other pink leaders persuaded the browns of the malicious intentions of the greens. The peace of the forest was broken, and the pink monkeys shrewdly sided with the greens in one area of the forest, the browns in another, and helped them to defeat their rivals, asking only to be rewarded with control of part of the tree worlds of the defeated tribes. In a startlingly short time, the pink monkeys had acquired footholds in the forest, and they used these to expand the areas of their control. They even hired many of the green and brown monkeys to help them in their enterprise. After that the wealth of the forest was at their mercy. We did nothing, Yuktasri told her mother. We thought this was something between the monkey people and it wasn't for us to intervene. We were stupid. We should have guessed that the pink ones would keep coming, and coming, and coming, there would be wave after wave of them, until they had taken over the whole forest. The goddess Aranyani could surely prevent the invasion, Pampa Campana suggested. But Yuktasri shook her head. She can surround the forest with her line of power, her protective reka, Yuktasri said, but it won't work if forest dwellers themselves invite the intruders in. And now the pinks are forest dwellers too, and many greens and browns support them. And talk about wanting to divide the forest into green zones and brown zones, and they are too dumb to understand that their attitude will lead to there being only one zone, neither brown nor green. Monkeys, what can you do? Yuktasri said. Her betrayal of the habitual respect of jungle denizens for one another indicating how bad the situation had become. You can't teach them anything. How can I help? Pampa Campana said. I don't even live here anymore. I don't know, Yuktasri replied. But I thought. If I'm going to die fighting the pink invasion, I want you here too. 
Because you need your mother, Pampa Campana asked, or because you want her to die in the battle as well? I don't know, old Yuktasri answered. Maybe both. Here there is an unexplained break in continuity in the Jayapur Jaya manuscript. It is possible that the author destroyed some pages, perhaps because the confrontation with her daughter was too painful to preserve in detail. Or simply because Pampa Campana turned away from that private matter to complete her account of the crisis. In her next passage, she moves away abruptly from this mother daughter scene and describes her second visit to the unseen forest goddess Aranyani. Here is that scene. As Pampa Campana has written it, it should be noted that this is the only instance in the entire body of ancient literature in which the forest goddess revealed herself fully to any human being. She, Pampa Campana, spread out her arms and called the goddess's name. Then the whirlwind came as before, and she was hidden inside the whirling leaves, and carried into the sky. The angry Chayels were there, wheeling above the roof of the forest as before, and the golden ball of light, and she, Pampa Campana, was standing on the topmost branch of the highest tree. But this time, the ball of light dissolved into air and there she was, Aranyani, floating on the sky, presenting herself to Pampa Campana without pretensions, not in the golden crown and bejeweled radiance of a god but plainly dressed in simple woodland clothes. Ask me, she said. As she had said once before. When I was nine years old, the great goddess Pampa herself entered me, Pampa Campana said. And if an aspect of her remains within me, maybe there is a greater strength in my body than I know. And if that strength is released, it can combine with yours, and together we can rid the jungle of this plague of short-tailed, hairless foreigners. Yes, the power is within you, Aranyani told her, and it is a far greater power than my own, and yes, I can release it. But when such a force bursts out of a mortal human body, it is very probable that the human body will be destroyed. If you do this, I cannot promise you that you will survive. I have failed my daughters all their lives, Pampa Campana said. At least this one time I can answer one of my children's calls for help. There's something else, Aranyani said. The moment is near when the gods must retreat from the world and stop interfering in its history. Very soon human beings, and monkeys of all colors. For that matter, will have to learn to manage without us and make their stories on their own. What will happen to the forest when it is no longer under your guardianship? Pampa Campana asked her. It will suffer the fate of many forests in the age of men, Aranyani said. Men will come. And either there will be open fields under cultivation here or else there will be houses and roads and maybe a small ghost forest will remain, and women will say, look, there stands the memory of the forest of Aranyani, and men will not believe them, or care. And this does not concern you? Our hour is over, Aranyani said, and it's your time now. So even if you, or the goddess coming out of you, and I together manage to win this battle, after that neither animals nor humans can count on us to protect or guide or help. The victory may be real but also temporary. You should understand that. Forever is a meaningless word, Pampa Campana said. Now is my only concern. When Aranyani descended in majesty toward the forest floor all living things bowed down in fear and respect. None of them had seen a divine being before and the only proper response to it was gratitude and awe. That was the day of the expulsion of all pink monkeys from the jungle. They went quietly, or, at most, muttering under their breath about the injustice of their removal and the certainty that one day, they would return. They were escorted out by the wild women, but everyone knew that the main force of the invaders was approaching, and this was just a preliminary move. Pampa Campana and the goddess went together to face the enemy. As they neared the northern perimeter, beyond which the battle would take place, Yuktasri Sangama approached her mother for the last time. I'll say goodbye, she said, and thank you. They went forward together. The two great ladies, goddess and woman, stood glorious together against the thin pink line of our invaders and wrought horrible destruction on our foes. She tells us, Pampa Campana tells us, 
that the wild women told her, long afterward, that Yuktasri had died peacefully and happily as she saw you win the war. And the jungle animals told her what they had seen, and she had translated their master language account into her own immaculate verse. The war was not really a battle. It was a single instant of doing. They became two golden suns. Goddess and woman. Flaming, blinding, burning. Utterly consuming the enemy. In their fire. After this extraordinary, cataclysmic event Pampa Campana's inert body was carried by the jungle women to her old home in the jungle and laid down to rest on a bed of soft mosses and leaves. Her eyes and mouth were open and had to be closed. And the women thought her dead and planned a funeral pyre, but then the voice of Aranyani filled the air as the goddess spoke for the last time to the creatures of the earth, saying, She is not gone, but sleeping. I have placed her in this deep, healing sleep. And I will cause great thickets of thorns to grow around her, and you must leave her there, until she is awakened by an act of love. Time passed. Can you feel it passing, like a ghost in a corridor floating past white curtains, blowing at open windows, like a ship in the night? Or a high migration of birds, time passed, shadows lengthened and shrank back, leaves grew and fell from branches, and there was life and death. And one day Pampa Campana felt something like a soft breeze touching her cheek and opened her eyes. A young woman's face was above hers. So like her own face that it seemed to her that she was floating above her body and looking down at herself. Then her thoughts cleared. The young woman was dressed like a warrior, with a great sword sheathed across her back. Who are you? Pampa Campana said. I am Zerelda Lee. The other replied, the daughter of 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 Zerelda Sangama and Grandmaster Li Yi He. All my kin have departed this life in various ways, leaving me with only one living relative. About whom my mother spoke with her dying words, the same words her mother said to her, and her mother, and her mother, and hers. The matriarch of our house is a woman named Pampa Campana, she told me. And she is still alive. Go to the forest of Aranyani. And make her give you what she owes you. I was holding her hand very tightly. What does she owe me, mother? I asked her, and she answered, everything. Then she died. And so you have come, Pampa Campana said. None of my ancestors believed what they were being told. Thinking it impossible that you could still be in this world. For some reason I had no doubt that it was all true and so I began my search, which was long and hard. I had to cut my way through the thorns to find you, said Zerelda Lee, with this sword, which you will recognize. Then I kissed you, I hope you don't mind that, but apparently that's what has revived you. An act of love, Pampa Campana said. And your mother was correct. That you owe me everything? Yes, said Pampa Campana, I do. Time returned to greet her, and history was reborn. It was the year 1509. Pampa Campana was 191 years old, and looked like a woman of 35 or so, 38 at the most. At least, she said to Zerelda Lee, for the moment, I still look older than you. And yes, I see that you have inherited this famous sword. But have you inherited the swordsmanship of your ancestor as well? I have been told that I am as good as the famous Zerelda Sangama and Grandmaster Lee Yihi combined, the young woman replied. Good, said Pampa Campana. We may need those skills. Pampa Campana now used the power of metamorphosis for the second of the three times, which were the goddess's gift. She gave Zerelda Lee a chill feather from one of her pockets and held another herself, and then they were flying, flying toward Bisnaga. Where the greatest king in the history of the empire was about to take the throne, and the love story at which Pampa Campana had hinted would soon begin. At first it would not be her own story, but one that would cause her heartache. And afterward turn into the strangest description of love she had ever known.